Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. My name is Gregory Ormsby Mori. I'm the Outreach Education and Outreach Coordinator with the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. This is the Agroforestry in Action webinar series. It's held about monthly. Um, and today we have uh, the pleasure of having with us as a presenter Steve Gabriel from an, uh, he's an extension agroforestry specialist at Cornell University in the Small Farm Center. Uh, the title for today's presentation is Log Grown Shiitake. Uh, it's going to focus on uh, some of the economics and, and, and a case study for of a profitable industry as a, as a template for successful agroforestry adoption by farmers and landowners. Steve Gabriel is an ecologist, an educator, he's a forest farmer, and he's the co-author of uh, a very uh, excellent and uh, increasingly popular book called Farming the Woods, an integrated permaculture approach to growing food and medicine in temperate forests. Steve co-founded the Finger Lakes Permaculture Institute and advocates for the balance of production and forest health as an agroforestry specialist for the Cornell Small Farms Program. Along with his wife, Liz, he stewards Wellspring Farm, Forest Farm in the Finger Lakes region of New York, where they produce shiitake mushrooms, duck eggs, maple and elderberry syrup, pastured lamb, and forest fruits. Uh, it really is a, a pleasure and uh, to have Steve uh, with us today as a presenter, and we're looking forward to it. So uh, with that, I'd like to hand it over to you, Steve. All right. Thanks, Gregory. Uh, you can hear me okay? Yes. So thank you, Steve. Uh, I am going to mute my mic now, uh, so there's not any echo. Uh, but again, the presentation should run about 45 minutes, and then we'll have uh, time for, for Q&A. Thanks so much. Okay, great. Thanks, Gregory. Thanks, everybody, for taking the time to come to the presentation this afternoon or late morning, depending on where you might be. Um, I'm looking forward. I've, I've been with this topic for quite so many years and, and it's been good to see the progression and its development and I think uh, one of the things we're going to talk about today is a bit of um, the light that shiitake production can shine on the potential for agroforestry. Um, in my experience we see a lot of landowners and farmers and students very interested in the topic of agroforestry and inevitably the question always comes up, well what about the economics? And of course, the more potentially profitable or economical a production system can be, the more easy it is, the easier it is for uh, for folks on the ground to really adopt it. And that's been a lot of the focus of our work with with mushroom cultivation um, is seeing seeing that opportunity to provide an incentive for uh, for producers to take part in in the management of their their forest lands. Um, so thanks, Gregory. I really appreciate the opportunity to work with the. Missouri Agroforestry Center, and um, and I'm excited to to share this information. And I'll just mention at the outset of this just a few links for folks. Um, CornellMushrooms.org is our mushroom cultivation website. Uh, the Small Farms website is SmallFarms.Cornell.edu. We focus a lot on on training beginning and new and and established farmers. We provide a lot of resources for them. And, um, and our, our personal farm website, if folks are interested, is wellspringforestfarm.com. And you can see my email on the slide here. Uh, feel free to reach out and uh, follow up with questions. And, and like Craig said, I'm going to shoot for a 45-minute presentation here, and then, and then we'll have some time for questions. So we're talking uh, primarily about the shiitake mushroom today. Um, folks in the, in the room here probably have a varied experience with, with mushroom cultivation. I know I recognize the names of some, some folks I know are growing commercially or for hobby, and some of you may be very new to the crop. Um, there's about, there's there's basically four mushroom species that we've seen reliable cultivation of in a woodland setting. Um, shiitake mushrooms, uh, oysters, lion's mane, and the red wine cap, Stropharia. And those uh, mushrooms um, are reliable in a woodland or outdoor setting. Most of them, uh, with the exception of the Stropharia, are easily cultivated on, on different types of wood, on logs or stumps. And um, the Stropharia generally likes beds of either wood chips or straw. 
Um, important to note, uh, if you're looking at indoor cultivation, there's a, a much wider range of mushrooms that you can you can grow. Uh, and I think that the potential for outdoor cultivation is actually uh, greater than we know. It's just that these four species are ones that we've seen people reliably produce across contexts in different parts of the country, um, and even in some cases for commercial purposes. So it's really, if you're interested in that piece, I think it's useful to uh, to focus your attention on this. Um, shiitake is, is a wonderful mushroom, very uh, agreeable with many people. It's a, it's a friendly mushroom, so to speak. It looks like what people expect. 97% um, of the mushrooms we consume in the in the United States right now are, are one species, the Agaricus bisporus, and that's essentially the cremini, the button, or the portobello, as you might know it. And so this is a, a brown cap and stem mushroom, uh, pretty friendly looking, and it's something that's been cultivated for, for close to a thousand years, uh, mostly in Asia. Um, in the States, uh, it wasn't even allowed in to the United States until 1981. Uh, and for most of its uh, time here in America, it's been seen as a sort of backyard hobbyist crop, and really only in the last decade have we started to look at the commercial potential of shiitake. Uh, shiitake is, is easily cultivated on what we call bolts. Um, these are three foot long uh, logs that are generally about four to eight, in, four to eight inches in diameter. Although you could, uh, theoretically, you could inoculate something longer than that or something much thicker, it just tends to be hard to move them around. And certainly in commercial production, and to some degree in hobby production, um, the name of the game is, is moving these logs around and, and making it comfortable for yourself. So that three foot length and that smaller diameter tends to be the best. Um, originally, it was assumed that shiitake was, was produced on and only uh, uh, possible to be produced on oak species. Uh, shiitake, from Japanese roughly translated, means mushroom of the oak. Uh, the shi tree in, in Japan and Asia is, is what is most commonly used. Uh, although we found, and, and uh, University of Missouri has also done research on substrates, we found a, a wide range of hardwood species that shiitake does, does excellent on. Uh, Cornell research showed that essentially sugar maple any of the oaks, we used red oak in our experiment, and, um, and American beech all produce uh, basically the same amount. Um, other possible uh, good wood substrates would, in, you know, species would include birch, um, uh, chestnut, if you had that available. Um, uh, blanking on some of the other ones right now, there's a, there's a whole list in one of our guidebooks, which I'll talk about in a bit. But the main ones that folks grow on are, are really the oak and the, the sugar maple. Um, as well. And Gregory's mentioning in the chat sweet gum. So if you're further south, uh, that's something that, that should be considered as a, as a good uh, substrate uh, for mushroom cultivation. And as you head farther north, then you might be thinking more about birch as a, as a good substrate. Um, and we can answer any questions if people have particular woods they might be curious about. Um, so these these mushroom logs are harvested in, in the manner you can see in the slide here. Um, easy to easy to move. You know this the 16 foot trailer can handle about 100 logs, um, and um, we'll talk a little bit about the harvesting. But we're not going to get too much into all the nitty gritty of how to cultivate. Um, that's something I have a plethora of other resources on. I want to get more into the sort of industry uh, focus for this talk. So just just for the folks that aren't familiar. Essentially, after you harvest those logs, and, and I should mention those logs should be uh, harvested uh, fresh. Um, so the fresher, the better, really, um, up to three months old. Uh, you don't want to go out and inoculate that tree that fell down in your backyard, you know, last fall, uh, because it's not going. It's probably colonized with another fungus and is not going to produce uh, nearly as well. So fresh logs. We're getting into the dormant season here in the Northeast and. Um, in other parts of the country where it's a great time to do your forestry work and cut those logs and really you can start inoculating anytime um, from now through the spring. Um, we found at Cornell basically you can cut and inoculate any time of the year um, and have good success although most folks tend to think about a, a winter uh, felling of the trees and then an early spring inoculation like March or April uh, so that the, the mushrooms have some opportunity to grow uh, and colonize the log. Uh, to inoculate, basically, what you take that fresh log, and there's three steps: basically, drill, uh, fill, and wax. So you can see here we drill uh, holes, about 50 holes, in one of those three-foot logs. Fill it with the spawn, which is available in a, a wide range of, of different uh, sort of materials: uh, dowels, wooden dowels you can hammer in, or sawdust spawn that you can plunge in. Um, 
and then the waxing is to cover up those holes, prevent uh, predators, uh, pests from eating the, the mycelium out of the log, and also to keep the moisture in the log up. So that's the basic kind of process of, of actually inoculating these logs. Now the beauty of shiitake, uh, unlike the other mushrooms I mentioned before, is it's it's real reliable fruiting cycle. The fact that we can essentially, after that inoculation, set these logs aside for one season. Um, if you're further south, um, it's where you don't have quite a such a cold winter season as us. Um, is, you know, it basically takes six months of time when the temperatures are above 55 degrees for these to colonize. And what that means is that the mycelium is colonizing and moving through the log material. And once it's fully colonized that log, it's then eligible for fruiting. So, uh, you know, up north we think about essentially a 12-month uh, cycle. If I inoculate logs in May, they'll be ready the following May for uh, fruiting. And that's basically because at least six months of the year is, is pretty cold up here. Uh, further south, you may have uh, a, a bit of a different window in terms of that. It generally takes six to eight months from inoculation to fruiting, again, if the temperatures are above 55 degrees. Once those logs have been colonized, well, the beauty is that you can soak them in water for 24 hours and force them to fruit. And uh, you don't have to do this. You can leave them sitting up in the woods and they'll fruit in response to uh, the right conditions, uh, whether that's temperature changes or um, uh, or potential um, you know, humidity, those kind of things, weather extremes, uh, temperature uh, and moisture are generally the two triggers that we see. Uh, but if you really want to get reliable cropping and, and anyone that's doing commercial really gets into the soaking, which would be putting them in the water, uh, pulling them out after 24 hours, and then generally you get fruiting within a week or so of that soak. So this is really nice, and, and as a grower, uh, in addition to being an extension educator around this topic, um, I find it a, a very enjoyable task to soak these logs. Often I'm doing them before I go to work in the morning and taking them out and then getting into the, cy the cycle of harvesting. And when you soak these, you generally see, uh, based on our research, about a quarter to a half pound of mushrooms per log per soak. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about those details in a bit. So I'm not going to, again, I'm going to diverge myself. I could talk all afternoon about the, the how-to. But I want to point you to a few resources if you're interested in learning more about the, the nuts and bolts of real, really inoculating and, and managing logs. The first is we have a, a, a publication booklet. It's a free PDF download, again, at cornellmushrooms.org. And that's something that you can download and check out. It's the culmination of several years of research in the Northeast, um, as well as a lot of grower input into best management practices, uh, really chock full of good information. And then also on the website, we have a series of videos that we collaborated with the National uh, Extension Network to produce, uh, featuring Dr. Mudge, who did a lot of research here at Cornell and is uh, my co-author on the on the book, and Ken goes through all those those details, and it's a really nice, high quality video, so you can really get a sense of the practice uh, of of cultivation. So what I want to do is is share a little bit about what's going on in terms of production uh, in our neck of the woods, um, and and we'll look at the Northeast and, and New York, and and look at some of the details of this industry. Um, just knowing how to grow something, of course, is, is only part of the, the challenge of, of finding a crop that's really ready for prime time in terms of production. So what we find today, and this is a survey that we did um, just this past uh, year, um, in New York State we have uh, right now 46 growers uh, um, who are into uh, commercial production or planning on starting commercial production in 2016. And these growers are, are working on about uh, 17,435 logs. Uh, and we estimate that that yields, based on our data, uh, close to 70,000 pounds of mushrooms over the productive life of those logs. Um, and so this is a, a significant uh, income potential uh, as a crop in New York State. Um, and this is really just the beginning. Um, probably five years ago, there would have been four or five commercial growers. So this is quite a rapid increase. And we see the interest in this um, just skyrocketing. So we have that kind of going on. Um, only about half of those actually sold mushrooms this past growing season. And the gross income for that, that year, when we add everyone's incomes together, uh, is, is around $180,000, or on average, you know, $7,800 per grower. Um, and what we see is that most growers are planning to expand production uh, in 2016. And, and there's more and more signing up and, and 
indicating that they're going to get into commercial production. So I, I would expect that in the next few years we'll see this number creep up towards 100 growers easily. And what's nice about production is that um, the market's quite wide open and, and we're getting good prices and, and folks don't feel that competitive nature of a new crop uh, just yet. Um, this was a survey done by Chatham University in Pennsylvania uh, where they looked generally in the Northeast. Um, we have a, a grower listserv that I'll talk about, which is where a lot of folks uh, stay connected to developments. Um, and they found 56 growers. This is again for the entire Northeast and about 18,000 logs in production uh, for an average uh, annual income per grower of about uh, $5,600. Um, and again, uh, you know, so those numbers are interesting because it doesn't, uh, I would argue certainly it doesn't capture what's going on in the Northeast. If, if we found almost 50 growers in New York alone, and I know of uh, 10 or 15 at least in Vermont, and as we look at other states, um, I think we, we easily have over 100 growers. So this survey didn't get to capture all that data. And honestly, part of that's because uh, mushroom growers sometimes are hiding out in the woods. <laughs> we don't always get to interface with them online. But we do find a commonality in that um, uh, these growers, again, are, are really looking to, to maximize and increase production over the next few years. So we should see you know, a significant increase in log production in the Northeast. And, um, and all, you know, 80% uh, really are in this place where they, they see their markets having a much larger demand than the supply that they or others around them can provide. So um, really good indications for, for potential production. So when we uh, look at this sort of from a systems perspective and think about agroforestry and, and encouraging production, um, there's, there's things I've teased out that I think are really critical to success. Um, of course, the first thing would be uh, that there's good cultivation research. Um, mostly mushroom cultivation research has been done by Cornell and, and, and University of Missouri, although there's some other universities um, and I keep coming across new research or, or I should say old research that, that I wasn't aware of, new to me. Um, but really, you know, learning uh, difference about, differences about sort of strain development as we get more and more refined with production. Um, if you think about the, variety, the, the, the number of varieties of apples or tomatoes out there, right, there's just a, a huge opportunity there um, to engage with, with developing strains that are highly adaptive to different conditions. Um, researching just the optimal conditions for successful fruiting and, and certainly efficiency also in terms of the way we manage. There's a lot of... of learning that we've had there that I'll share. The second thing would be to really look at the economics of the crop. Um, and consistent production is really key. Can I reliably bring mushrooms to the market, you know, at least 10 to 15 weeks out of the growing season? Um, that seems to be really important and, and luckily with shiitake we can really uh, justify that. Um, we'll talk about some of the pieces about around market demand and return on investment and, and different products that can come out of cultivation. And I think all these things really help us look at at shiitake and, and, and see its potential viability. Um, beyond just the how to grow and then how to make money or what the profit margins are, that sort of thing, I think there's a, a third layer that's important for crop adoption and that would be um, supporting this industry development. Uh, individual growers do not have the same power or leverage that a group of growers or the group of growers in partnership with a university um, have. And we've seen that time and time again within the extension system uh, nationwide that a uh, crop is not going to get off the ground if it doesn't have that, that widespread support from different networks. Um, and we'll share, I'll share a bit about some of the, the fun uh, regulation and legal uh, things I've, I've run into and I'm currently working on around this. So um, we're, we're realizing some of the barriers to adoption don't have to do with how to grow or even the economics, but actually um, these, this kind of larger tier of, of developmental pieces. And then I think as we zoom out, one of the key things is that we, we want to see a crop in agroforestry generally uh, really hit some big picture uh, solutions. Um, and so mushrooms, are, again, if I think about this as sort of a template why mushrooms are working, they, they, they sort of simultaneously solve a lot of bigger issues. And we're going we're gonna to dig a little bit deeper. So this is kind of the outline for how the rest of this presentation is going to roll. So shiitake, um, as I mentioned, Cornell and University of Missouri have done a lot of cultivation research. Um, we have good economic viability. This is kind of the summary of it. Um, good reliable production. In, again, in New York, we say June to October. A little bit further north, and you're going to need to shrink that window of production, and a little bit further south, and, and you're lucky because you can increase that. Uh, I know some growers down in Georgia who are growing almost year-round outdoors. So, um, you know, depends on where you live for that one. And really good prices at market. 
Um, the, the nature of mushrooms is also that we have uh, very little crop loss, and I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, we've done a lot with industry development. The biggest uh, boon to our success, I think, is, is these grower networks that we've established and maintained, and I'll share more about how you can get involved with that if you're interested. And then I've mentioned a lot of these issues that we've developed and worked through, and they've been surprisingly um, satisfying and easy to work through. Um, finding the right partners and, and finding the right timing has been has been really critical, and, and often being patient um, has been critical for, for our success. And then finally, um, with shiitake, uh, there's this great use for what we call low-value timber or small diameter wood, um, things that aren't going to uh, simply have a, a long-term value in, in terms of a, a timber crop um, or for other uses. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunity to get in the woods and thin them out, do good management, and then get the material for mushroom logs. And, and there's just tons of this material. Um, it's really an endless supply. And we see also mushrooms in not just a, having a food value, but also a medicinal value. And so it really hits kind of these bigger uh, picture items, which, which again, I'm, I'm going to dig into a little bit here. So with cultivation, um, I'll mention some of the things that we've looked at at Cornell. We've looked at the species of wood that is, is good for production. Um, we've looked at timing of cutting and inoculating. So I mentioned we basically cut and inoculated uh, logs every month of the year and found that they worked every month of the year. <laughs> it was slightly better to do it in the spring uh, than, uh, and, and in the winter than in any other month, than in summer or fall, but it does work any time of year, which is pretty significant. Um, we looked at the, the ways to force fruiting. We looked at soaking logs versus sprinkling them with overhead sprinklers versus doing nothing. Basically found that if you want that, that high volume production that you need, to engage with soaking. You cannot get away with sprinklers, unfortunately. We looked at yields from soaking. Again, it's really nice to be able to say, on average, a quarter to a half pound of mushrooms per log every time you flush it. Um, and how many flushes can you get out of that log before it's spent? Generally about eight flushes. So those kind of numbers are really useful, and that comes out of you know 10 years worth of cultivation research. And we looked at some different things like uh, that might be concerns for growers. Uh, one example is com competitive fungi, um, those little bracket fungi or, or surface fungi that you find on the bark as a grower. Uh, we generally found in our research it's not something you need to worry about. That is not a, a fungi that are competing with the, the shiitake, which tend to consume and, and feed off the interior of the log. And again, you know, as we got more and more mature with our research, we started to look at management and how efficiency and decision making on the farm level could really affect uh, profitability. One interesting research project just to share um, that I think is, is really important for folks to keep in mind as this, this industry continues to grow and develop is, is how low, uh, of a, or I should say how small of a library we really have in terms of um, uh, species diversity and, and variation within a different species. And we call these strains. You might be familiar in, in horticulture with cultivars, but we in, in mushroom cultivation we call them different strains of mushrooms. And um, you know, often cases we, we have uh, spawn suppliers who can only offer one or, or maybe two strains of a given species. And um, if I'm buying spawn from someone in in Washington State, let's say, and I'm in New York, that strain may not perform and may not be adapted to my conditions as much as it is to the the, the production that, that you would see in Washington. And we had a grad student several years ago now um, who compared this. And, and what this is, this graph is showing is basically this is, a, let me find this arrow here. Um, the, the bar on the left here is, is FFP3, is Field and Forest Products. It was their uh, commercial lion's mane strain available at the time from Wisconsin. And our grad student um, isolated three local uh, strains of heresium. So this is the lion's mane mushroom. And she, she compared the production of HE3, 4, and 5, which would be New York State strains, to the, the commercially available strain, essentially the field and forest products. And you can see the, um, the production being just, just phenomenally better on these local isolates. And so this really lends to maybe a, a further avenue of research or something that we really need to start paying more attention to, which is the opportunity for uh, foresters and, and mushroom foragers and, and growers to really look to their local ecosystems as a source of substrate um, and, and pull those mushrooms out of the wild and isolate them and actually use them as, as part of their production system. And this is, again, something if we think about, we know some of the advances and some of the benefits of, of this types of breeding and selection. Um, in adopt, uh, adapting to uh, changing climate conditions in uh, increases in yield um, 
and in diversity of production. So you have nice aesthetics, so you have different qualities that come out. We also occasionally see a mushroom, like lion's mane for instance, grow on a, an odd species of wood um, that may not be as what it's commonly found on, and that, that can be a, an advantageous uh, characteristic to, to breed for. So that's an interesting trial that really uh, gives us some insight into the potential for future local isolation. Um, another another area that I think research more research could be done, and I see more and more growers getting interested in this, are the what we call the cold weather strains. Um, this is a snapshot from Field and Forest's uh, strain catalog, just showing some of the, the different ones they have. And a lot of their strains originate in Korea and Japan and China, and they've done a number of excursions over there to get these. And then they see what does well in their cold Wisconsin weather. Um, and these cold weather strains are very interesting, especially for northern states, because they're, they're highly uh, adoptive. And um, they don't require soaking. They essentially fruit when the weather is kind of going back and forth from, from freezing temperature to warming temperature or, or in the 40s to the 60s. You know, when the weather's kind of shifting itself back and forth, you can get quite a plethora of mushrooms. And it's really been a season extension um, uh, opportunity for, for our farm. I think I harvested my last shiitakes just a week ago um, because we've had such a mild uh, start to our winter. And that's, that's quite incredible. The, the soaking logs, the strains that we generally soak, would not, have not shown any signs or interest in production. They've more or less shut down. And these cold weather strains really, especially in, in colder weather areas, provide opportunity for folks to think about extending their season. And as I mentioned, they're not a soaking, uh, they're not a, a mushrooms that generally respond to soaking. And so you generally set these up in your woods and you sort of get them when you get them. But there's, there's a lot more potential there to do research and development of these kind of strains. And so further gaps in research, um, you know, one thing to mention, uh, when we look at the forest management, forest health aspect of this, um, one of the questions that remains is around which trees are maybe more productive than others. Let me just move forward here. So here's in, um, here's a, a, a picture of forestry management in England. This is uh, what's called coppice agroforestry and coppice is this interesting function where you can uh, cut a tree off at the stump um, if you give it sufficient light that stump will re-sprout and regrow and then you can basically craft your 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 trees into poles and so this is a, a form of pole wood forestry short rotation small diameter wood is produced for a lot of different things this is sweet chestnut and this is actually in Japan how shiitake logs are most often grown. They're grown in 20 to 30 year rotations where they grow the poles to the exact diameter. And so there's obvious, obvious benefits to that um, for, for production and for the ease of harvest because um, your, your poles are now all in a small stand together. But there's also another benefit, which is that, excuse me, <coughs> um, which is that when you grow trees in this, uh, fashion, you're getting a, a log that's essentially entirely sapwood. And we know that shiitakes prefer to digest the sapwood of a tree. And compare this to a densely uh, overstood forest in the northeast, where a lot of those trees have, have formed a lot of heartwood because they've grown so slowly. And so it's potential that uh, those sapwood-rich trees are going to be much more productive than the, the heartwood-rich trees. Um, and so the, the type of forest management could really be impacted if we can see the, the sort of uh, production really increase. And um, this is a big research question that would take probably another 10 years to answer, but it's certainly something that I think would be worth paying attention to. So again, in Japan, we see 20 or 30 year oak coppices, essentially, where a farmer will go in and they'll cut in the rotation, they'll cut maybe a quarter acre clear cut of these coppice stands, and then they'll allow them to regrow over the next 20 or 30 years and then harvest again. So very interesting production system and really has some interesting implications potentially for the future. I mentioned um, we did a lot of research and, and we worked with 25 growers and took data on how they were spending their time and this really gave us some interesting insight. One of the things is that if you look at this, over half of the time that folks spend uh, in their production cycle is really in the, the felling of the trees and the inoculating of logs, right? And so there's a lot of importance to be paid for how uh, folks are inoculating logs to be as efficient as possible and also how they're basically everything up to the actual management and harvest is is half of your time or more than half and so there's a lot of things to dig in deeper and consider how we can improve efficiencies 
We also looked at uh, their sort of earnings uh, and profit per bolt. Um, this is again from, from 25 growers in a research project. And we found that, um, you know, generally speaking, it costs about $5 per bolt to inoculate. And I'll mention that that includes labor uh, in the process of management of that log at $12 an hour. And we found that generally the average earnings to be um, somewhere around $9. And um, this, you know, the, the difference here, the profit per bolt, is really a, a, a up to the farmer in a lot of cases. So we saw people, you can see this bar here is really showing the, the opportunity here is almost $12 in profit per bolt. And those were farmers that made choices and really minimized their upfront costs and expenditures. All right? And then the ones that were way down here, there's actually some that didn't make any profit or way down here, those were the folks that um, bought the new chainsaw or used the new ATV or had a lot of expensive equipment purchases as part of their plan. And so we really got to see just this incredible range of profitability that really relates to the choices that farmers are actually making. And so we looked at and summarized some of these things. And again, you can find these in the, in the guide to, um, to shiitake farming that I mentioned previously. But some of the things, uh, one way to save time or save money is actually to purchase bolts. Um, very few of us have the logging equipment, the expertise, or are frankly that efficient at harvesting wood. And so in, in many cases, it can actually be more profitable to purchase logs uh, instead of doing them yourself as a grower. And I'll talk a little bit more about the emerging potential of that industry um, and its benefits in a bit. Um, the efficient setup of the inoculation is, is super critical. And I, I tell farmers that probably the, the biggest place you can save time and money is really making your inoculation setup as efficient, as assembly line-like as possible. And um, we see that growers continuously need to engage volunteers in this. If farmers are just inoculating their own logs by themselves, it takes a really long time to get the work done. Uh, but a lot of farmers will have a little work party and they'll bring some, some friends over and they'll provide food and they'll say, hey, if you help me out for a few hours, you can take a couple of these logs home. And that's really a great way to get a lot of logs done. And I, I have a, generally I have a pretty committed crew that knows every spring I'm gonna call on them you know, eight or ten folks, and we can we can bang out a hundred logs in an evening um, because they're just able to focus, able to have a good time, and, and really see it as as a good way to participate in the farm. Um, you know, we see also in the way the lane yard, which is where you put your logs, how you stack them, how you manage them, where your water tanks are, the the actual design of that can also save a lot of time. I've mentioned before that the name of the game is moving logs from point A to point B and and back again. So. Um, really thinking about that and thinking that through is, is, a, is an important way to, to save time and money. And, you know, I mentioned that over half of our labor is, is, is in the preparation of logs for future management. And so this is a really nice system because often farmers have more time in, in winter and spring and they can get a lot of this work done before the real rush of the growing season comes on, right? So thinking about timing uh, is really critical. And then finally, I've really recommended that folks try to avoid purchasing equipment. And again, you might avoid this by uh, that first bullet point. Purchasing those bolts means you don't have to have some of the equipment that might really cut into your profitability. So that's the cultivation stuff that we've worked on. That, that sort of bleeds into economics. And I'm just going to share a few things around economic viability that we found. I mentioned the yield of each log, uh, producing a quarter to a half pound per flush. Um, generally, uh, in the north, again, uh, a grower can, if you do the math, because after you soak a log, you actually need to rest it for several weeks, uh, generally six to eight weeks before you soak it again. Um, so generally, when we do the math of how many months we have or how many weeks we have, uh, in New York, uh, a grower can generally flush a log two or three flushes per season. Um, again, a little further south, you might be able to push that a little bit more. And we found that, you know, the log lifespan then is about eight flushes worth or three to four years and it's tricky because we say these averages but the growth of mushrooms is really on a curve meaning that when the log is young in its first year it actually produces a lot more mushrooms and as it gets older and older like many of us it produces a lot less it starts to have those growing pains okay and so um, it's tricky because as a as a farmer you're constantly cycling old logs out and bringing new ones in. It makes our economics a little bit confusing, right? Because you always have some logs actually producing a lot less and some producing a lot more. Um, so our, our first year logs sometimes will produce a pound you know, per flush, just absolute gorgeous uh, to witness. Um, but you know, again, over time, because you have that age diversity, 
as an inevitable part of your management, you tend to average out to these kind of numbers. The market demand has been really interesting to watch, and we, we hope it stays this way. Um, we think that profitability can still be achieved at, at $10 a pound even for shiitake, but we're seeing uh, across the Northeast again, uh, urban markets, rural markets, it doesn't matter that, that growers are able to maintain $12 to $16 a pound retail for these mushrooms. Generally, wholesale is a little bit less, $10 to $12 a pound. Um, but that's, that, that works really well for folks, and um, it's amazing because it's two or three times what the grocery store is selling indoor-grown shiitakes for. And uh, it it's, it's really comes down to the quality of the product, and, and if you find the right markets, the consumer, the chef, uh, whoever is willing to pay more when they see, touch, and taste, and smell um, these, these log-grown mushrooms and really the superior quality that they offer. Um, so... You know, we'll see how this, this plays out over time, but right now we're really in a boon of sort of the, the price per pound, and we're hoping to see it stay that way. So it's interesting, too, because the mushrooms can be, as I mentioned, sold fresh is one piece, but there's lots of other possibilities. And, and what's really exciting to me is, is how there's really, I, I say to new growers, there's no excuse for any crop loss because you can turn mushrooms that may not look as nice uh, into uh, such a wide range of value-added products, and really they can be as valuable, if not more valuable, than the fresh mushrooms themselves. And for growers that are in very rural areas, this may actually be a really important thing because they don't have to worry so much about preserving the mushrooms fresh. Um, again, looking at how Asia does it, um, most mushrooms are grown in very remote areas. They're dehydrated and then they're sent to urban markets. Okay, so dried mushrooms have a, a huge potential and a grower could decide to go all in on dried and probably find those same markets. We're finding the demand for dried mushrooms, especially in the winter, as we get out of the season where lots of local foods and fresh foods are available, are just as popular. We're selling out just as quickly of those uh, as we are with the fresh. Um, we've also experimented this year with, with shiitake powder, where we powder the mushrooms. We actually dehydrate the stems and powder those, and we're almost sold out of that. It's the, the, the interest in that, and, and that's used as a flavoring. It's sort of like a seasoning um, or, all, or a breading for meats or other things. Um, just phenomenal response to that. So. There's really no excuse. There's lots of products, and, and what's nice is your mushrooms may not look pretty, but they can certainly do uh, do you well in these kind of kind of products. And I'll mention here too that you know you have to check with your local state regulators because there's obviously uh, licensing, food processing, um, verification, things like that that have to that have to be part of this if you're going to get into value added. But the potential is really great. The third way that people are selling mushrooms and and um, an increasingly growing interest is in the medicinal properties. Um, this is a grower near me who is doing a, a line of tinctures that are selling quite well. Um, both mushrooms he grows and also ones that he finds foraging. And folks are also doing things like growing uh, the mycelium out and powdering that and putting that into pills, things like that. So there's a wide range of interest in that as well. And you can, depending on the, the ailments or the, the properties you're looking for, there's lots of different ways to prepare either the fruiting bodies or the mycelium or, or different things of these mushrooms. And uh, this is an interesting avenue because it's tricky to make health claims, to understand, to, to kind of navigate which products may be better or, or, or more inferior. But this is certainly something that a lot of our farmers are going to. And I see now mushroom growers who are exclusively growing for the medicinal supplement market. So again, a lot of opportunity, even if you had 10 mushroom growers around you selling fresh, uh, you could you could find your niche with the medicinal products. So I want to summarize the the sort of return on investment here. Um, I've mentioned this before. We looked at some of the numbers here, but um, out of those t uh, 25 participants I mentioned that we took data from, 15 of them actually had complete data sets, and so we were able to really analyze those. And 10 of those made a profit from their production in the in the second year. And I mentioned that that profit was highly variable which is based on a lot of the decisions that the individual farmers made. Okay, um, But what we find is that average profit's about $5 a log, or 15 to 20 over that, that three-year lifetime, or maybe four years. Okay, So um, the way I, I like to summarize it is $5 in, and you're getting $5 out every year for three or four years. So it's a pretty good return on investment, and it's quite easy for folks to wrap their heads around. One of the things we're going to release very soon, I've been just getting the, the final touches on here, is we, we've created a enterprise budgets. Uh, this was work we started with the University of Vermont several years ago, where growers can plug in different variables, how many logs they're going to have in production, how often they're going to soak, and they'll get some numbers out so they can really think about how they're going to dry 
uh, try to sell these and, and, and where the profit might come from. So um, that's something that we found is, is in high demand and something that we're going to start uh, doing a bit more work on, uh, these kind of enterprise budgets and tools. All right, industry development. Um, I'm going to talk about some of these pieces. So I mentioned the listserv. Um, this, is, this is actually an old screenshot from our old Cornell Mushroom website. Um, but we started an informal listserv, which has become um, really the, the nexus of our work. And it's a great way to stay in touch. Um, oops, sorry. I think um, my slides are a little out of order. I apologize for that. So here's a listserv. Here's an example of someone um, posting a question. And, and I often uh, get questions directed to me. And I say, hey, do you mind posting that to the listserv? Because we get seven or eight responses instead of just my opinion. And it often spurs a really interesting conversation. Uh, we just had a great thread about uh, chaga, uh, if you could grow it, where you get it, the ethical harvesting, whole conversation around that. And then there's also a lot of new growers that often post questions that get responses from, from a wide range of folks. It's, 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 a, it's a great resource. And if you go to cornellmushrooms.org and you click on network, uh, the network tab, you can find out how to apply uh, or, or sort of sign up for that listserv. Um, really nice resource. So we, we've provided that base support and really it's just uh, actually the University of Vermont hosts this listserv and there's nothing else other than allowing people to sign up and once they do it uh, it's that there's we're getting close to 300 members uh, it's a real phenomenal resource and we, we're constantly learning new things from it. We've, we've started to identify our audience more in, in New York State interestingly enough um, 20 percent of what is designated as farmland is actually in forest. All right, so there's a large pool of land that's that's about a million and a half acres that are actually farms that are that have a, a chunk of their land designated as forest. Um, so that's one of our target audiences. We we tend to focus on new and beginning farmers as we promote this um, because you know folks that have been doing grain for the last 50 years are probably going to have, have the equipment, the expertise, and the interest in that. Um, but new farmers generally looking at small, diversified, niche crop type enterprises, so they tend to be the ones we're focused on. We've also identified that working woodlot owners are an audience that are really important as we develop this industry. Um, there's a great National Forest Owners Survey. Um, we look at uh, different categories. So there's a lot of woodland owners that are absentee, essentially. They own the land. They don't do much uh, with it. But there's a significant chunk of folks, uh, it's about you know, 56,000 in New York State that are what we call the, wo the working woodlot owners. And these folks manage well over 2 million acres and, and are interested in what they can do, especially as they identified in the survey, they're really concerned about land taxes. Um, and this is something that farmers and woodlot owners share, is this concern and this challenge with managing and owning land and having to pay, uh, sometime, in some cases in some regions, very high taxes. And so what we started to look at is how do we translate our economic analysis to uh, potentially qualifying growers in New York State for ag exemption. And essentially ag exemption is where if you make over $10,000 a year in gross income, you don't have to be profit, just gross income, you can take that $10,000 and, uh, and then say I'm, a I'm eligible for tax exemption and you can have your tax assessor come out, they'll uh, look at the land as actually in production and then they'll tax it at the, the farm rate. And so a simple way of thinking about this in New York is, let's say your, your land is valued at $2,000 an acre. If you qualify for ag exemption, they'll look at your forested land and they'll give it a classification of forest land under agricultural production. And now that land will be taxed at about $350 an acre. Okay. If it's open land, if it's not forested land, then it becomes uh, based on your soil type. How potentially productive that land will be will determine your tax rate. But anyway, in New York, everyone's always getting into farming and saying, I want to hit that $10,000 mark and, and get my taxes down. So we said, well, what would it take to actually do that? And basically, uh, for that, you need about 1,000 logs in production. And this is a very common uh, scale of production. Um, and it would cost, uh, as you'd expect, a little under $5,000. Uh, this includes your labor to establish and manage this. And by year three, you should be able to produce enough pounds to, to break that $10,000 mark. And you could perpetually sustain this um, basically as a part-time uh, side gig and be able to qualify your land for agricultural exemption. Okay, so as we look for industry pathways, it's been really key to, to make these links. And, and now we're, our, our next sort of campaign is to really encourage growers to think about this $10,000 mark. But to, in order to do this, um, we needed to actually have the, the New York State Legislature say that 
uh, yes, log-grown mushrooms are considered an agricultural crop because there was actually confusion around this. And mushrooms generally, as we look at industry development, have a lot of confusing aspects to them. And so um, I'm happy to say that this fall, we finally, this was a two-year process. It was, it was very much the work of the Farm Bureau, who are a great uh, partner uh, in, this, in this kind of industry development who lobbied on our behalf, you know, slipped a, a, a sentence into one bill and, and all these different things, and, and finally it went through two years after we started the conversations. And so now uh, maple syrup and mushrooms are the only forest-grown products, really the only agroforestry products, arguably in New York right now, that are clearly defined as crops and that can be eligible for this rate. And this is significant because in New York you couldn't count your woodland um, in, in different designations depending on how it worked out. So it, it provides an incentive, it allows a farmer to basically uh, look at mushrooms, and mushrooms are much easier enterprise arguably to get into than the maple syrup production. So um, a good a good development and we're getting lots of interest just based on the fact that people are saying, oh hey I can make 10,000, you know, sign me up. Um, another issue we worked at was um, was with the legal uh, sort of insurance aspect. So we had a lot of growers in Northeast get their policies dropped or get denied policies because insurers were really concerned about the potential of poisoning people with mushrooms. And we found that this is really just because folks weren't familiar with mushrooms and were really quite f afraid. Some companies said, well, we'll insure indoor cultivation operations, but we won't insure anything outdoors. And so, again, we worked with Farm Bureau, and Farm Bureau's partner, insurance partner is Nationwide. We basically had a few agents out, they toured some farms, and they realized that the risk of growing log-grown mushrooms is not any greater than any other kind of vegetable production or fruit production. And so it was a relatively easy process that, you know, again, took over a year, so some patience was required, but um, now we can say that nationwide, and you know, anywhere in the States, if you're doing a log-grown operation, um, you can now uh, get insurance, at least through one company. Uh, I won't speak for all of them. Um, we've we've worked a lot with regulation as well. So one of the questions around selling uh, material is is do mushroom logs fall under firewood regulations? Um, and I've done some work, extension work around this, and, and trying to share with regulators what kind of species we're using, what kind of threats there are in terms of moving invasive species and pests around. And the good news in in New York State is that there's an exemption for essentially industry related products. And so if it's not intended to be used as firewood, if it's intended with an industry, um, it's actually not considered firewood and is exempt from those kind of transportation laws. So this means I can harvest wood and I could take it down to a friend in New York City or somewhere um, and sell those bolts to them if they're interested in that. Now, of course, we're going to encourage folks source their wood as locally as possible, um, but there's some interesting boundaries that this helps, especially in a state like New York where things are rather large. Um, and the reasoning behind this is that, you know, uh, we're hoping that the, the people participating as folks in the forest or agroforestry industry are paying attention and they're not going to transport or be interested in wood and they're actually going to be uh, allies on the ground scouting for potential pest uh, transportation issues. Um, and so we want to really encourage, you know, people's participation in, 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 in that monitoring effort. Um, so there was some inst instances where we were finding people weren't able to access wood, believe it or not, especially down near York near New York City, they couldn't find folks that could provide them with logs. So now we've kind of opened that up. Um, and so there's lots of opportunities and now we just need to get the folks on board to, to, to fill the, the gaps. Uh, a final way that we've worked with industry um, is, is in standardization and verification. So again with mushrooms, uh, outdoor cultivation, uh, indoor cultivation as well, sometimes the the different parameters for water quality and for management and for what substrates are, are acceptable uh, have not been um, as clear as, as we'd like them to be. So one thing we worked with was we were looking for a labeling uh, organization that could take on some of the standards. Um, so a council of six of us growers and mushroom producers worked with Certified Naturally Grown. Um, these standards are actually on their website right now and they're looking for public feedback. So anyone that's interested or thinks they have a stake in this, it would be great to have you review those and share any feedback that you may find. So we really hashed through a lot of things that, you know, honestly as a grower I hadn't necessarily thought of in as great a detail as I would have, have hoped to. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, having a label and being able to say there's a standard uh, for production is really critical to, to future success. And, and I think we'll see the literacy and the understanding of mushrooms continue to, to grow um, over the next few years. So I'll finish here. 
and we'll get into questions, but I wanted to hit on some of the big picture, you know, pieces and why this is working well. I've, I've, you know, we zoomed into a lot of these little details, and and I have to say I was, I was so interested in just teaching people to grow. I, a lot of those last things, the industry, the legal, the insurance, was not were not things I was expecting to deal with, um, but they are important pieces of this. But at the end of the day, you know, we have to look at some of the the, the land use issues that um, that are confronting us uh, as we move forward. And so one of the big things is that often landowners are only utilizing their forests for periodic timber or firewood harvest. And that's perfectly fine. <coughs> Excuse me. And that can be done sustainably, certainly. But there's a lot of intermediary uh, management that could happen that no one is doing because there's just no incentive. So agroforestry provides one potential incentive to do that, that good intermediate thinning. If you want to have, what I say to folks is if you want to have timber someday, you need to cut those small diameter trees out and release the ones that have the, the greatest chance of success. And the incentive is to say, well, guess what? That eight inch tree that you think has only value in the wood box could make you a few hundred dollars in mushrooms. And that really changes the story for folks and gets them interested in, in forest management. And so we, we promote this as a way, and, and it was really emerging uh, out of our work to see how this really related and could tie back to forest management and how the, the, the potential is there to marry the two. And it's really important to encourage folks and to think about it yourself if you're a grower or landowner, that you don't want to go out and shop for the mushroom logs. Okay, You don't want to go into your woods and say, well, that one looks straight, that one looks good. What you want to do is, is work with a forester or develop a management plan and do the thinning that's best for the forest health. And the byproduct of that thinning can be your mushroom substrate. The mushrooms don't care. They don't need the perfect logs. And, and the best trees should be the ones that stay in the woods. right? So. Um, so we can really focus on forest health as our first bottom line and then and then get our mushroom logs as a, as a bonus of that. And so if you're not interested in, in, in actually growing the mushrooms themselves, there's some emerging uh, potential for a woodlot owner to actually make some income um, providing and supporting this growing industry. So one thing is that we've seen people sell inoculated bolts. Okay, So again, for about $5 of cost, you can sell these for about $15 to $20, which is actually about the same you get from managing them. Right? But you're not actually taking care of them. You're selling them to other landowners, people that want to garden in their backyard. And our farm probably sells you know, 100 to 200 of these logs a year. Uh, and we could probably do more if we wanted to get into that. Um, so you could just simply harvest wood, inoculate it, and sell. Now this high price of 15 to 20 is generally a retail price that folks are paying when they just are buying a few logs. This is not something you would you'd be able to sell at this rate for like a farmer, someone that's looking into, into production. You could just sell logs um, that aren't inoculated, like fresh logs. Okay, in a cord of wood, there's about 150 of those three-foot logs, and so there's different rates that you can charge as a landowner to a farmer who may, or or a backyard grower who may want to just buy the logs from someone else. And um, you know, if if the if the the purchaser is doing more of the work, like they're going in and doing a salvage after a timber harvest, they might pay 50 cents a log. If you're willing to cut uh, take care of and and send those logs, uh, sort of deliver them to the farm. You can get two to three three dollars per log, and that translates to about three hundred to four hundred fifty dollars a cord. So uh, substantially better than than doing it for firewood, and actually a lot less processing because you're generally trying to keep the logs fresh. You're not doing any splitting, um, and so it can be quite a profitable venture for someone to just kind of set themselves up for selling you know these blank logs for cultivation. So here's what it looks like. I actually bought these from a logger a couple years ago. Um, he, he preferred to do them in six foot lengths and deliver them to me. Uh, we did, I think, 225 a log. He was happy. I was happy. It worked out really great. Okay. And it, the only thing to mention here, you know, the price is going to depend. And, and unlike firewood, there's a lot of more detail. So the, the grower, if you're going to sell uninoculated bolts, you have to pay a little more attention than you would with firewood. So of course the species and the timing is going to be important, the size. Generally growers want to have a standard size, so they want to see all their logs you know, cut to three foot length. But the biggest important thing that's going to affect someone who's managing their woods is basically the amount of scarring or bark damage. And so one of the challenges is that we're working with is, is what are the type of harvesting systems that can keep these logs essentially from getting all banged up? Because a lot of these folks are used to just dragging them out behind the tractor or the skidder, and that's just not going to be acceptable for shiitake production. So that's something we're going to have to have to consider. But if you're willing to take a little extra care, you can make a little bit of a decent amount of money uh, managing your forest. 
And I just wanted to show this that uh, the folks in Wisconsin are, are actively working on this. Um, they have a wood source connection and are trying to make these connections between growers and, and woodlot owners. Uh, and that's, that's run by the field and forest folks, among others. And finally, I mentioned that you know health and medicine, I think, is something to keep paying attention to. I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for us um, as we get into more, more production. So, you know, as I zoom out, um, uh, this, is, this is sort of the last slide here, and we'll, we'll, we'll shift to questions. Um, you know, in addition to mushrooms, when I think about these criteria, the, the cultivation research, looking at economic viability, the supporting industry development, and sort of those big picture problems, <clears throat> you know, other agroforestry crops that we are starting to look at as potential to fit this criteria and really work out in the long term are pawpaw and elderberry. And University of Missouri has done a, a ton of great work on elderberry that we're we're looking at how we can adopt in the Northeast. And if you work through each of these things on the list, you know the, both of these crops have good cultivation research. Um, both have decent economic viability. Industry development is kind of the next thing that needs to happen for them. Okay, so uh, that has happened in Missouri, I know, and also in Minnesota with the elderberry. Um, lots of co-ops and sort of grower development and pawpaw is happening more in like Ohio and, and West Virginia, Virginia area. And so, you know, if extension uh, growers, networks can collaborate, I think other fruits, uh, other crops that are considered agroforestry crops could also be uh, heading along that same track um, as the shiitake mushrooms. So with that, I will open up the floor to questions. Thanks for your attention. Um, I went a little, 10 minutes over or so, but I'll stay 10 minutes extra, so we'll make sure we can answer questions. Um, and before I open up to Greg, I'll just mention that if folks are interested in, in you know, learning more and, and, and even learning how to cultivate, we do have a, the Small Farms has a, a mushroom cultivation course that I teach. Uh, it's, the next session starts February 23rd, uh, and we also have a number of sort of in-person things if you're in the New York State area. We do a Camp Mushroom every year, which is a fun weekend training. Um, and also we'll be at the, the Maple Conference in New York State and you can find out more about those at the Cornell Mushroom uh, website. So well, thank you, Steve. We'll uh, can, can you hear me? Move into questions. Okay, this is Gregory here. Uh, thank you, Steve, for that uh, great Again. presentation. I'm just going to take a second here and open up a uh, question and answer box. It'll take me a second here. Um, perhaps, Steve, while, uh, while that's getting set up and people have time to uh, write in some questions, um, I, I, I'm very curious, uh, to maybe you could uh, talk about uh, the coppice potential. And, and uh, uh, so, folks, there is the question and answer box. You, you just, I hope you can see that on your screen. Um, and there should be a, a, a bar down below where you can enter your questions. And, and Steve, when the questions come up, you'll, you'll be able to see them. Uh, but uh, the, the coppice uh, management, uh, very interesting. Um, so I'd, I'd, I'd be really interested to learn more about that and, and maybe if there's more you can say about uh, the coppice management potential for, for a long-grown mushroom uh, shiitake operation. And, and looking forward, if there's any plans for... for for establishment or research on that, and, and, and also, I suppose, in the region of the Northeast, uh, what uh, species would probably best lend themselves to, to that kind of management system? Sure. Um, so I think, you know, coppice is something that uh, is, is well established in Europe uh, and it has a long history. And, and didn't really make its way to North America by and large. Um, and so, you know, one of the challenges, especially with shiitake production, is is that it's hard to go. You know, in Japan, you might have your grandfather's coppice of oak that you can you can kind of piggyback on and harvest and mm. and continue your rotation. Here, we kind of have to get it started. Um, and so that's the challenge because some folks aren't going to be interested in something that's going to take you know twenty or thirty years to. To, to hit maturity. So we, we've been looking a little bit at alternative species that might grow faster than oak, for instance, and still produce good good quality shiitake. Um, so uh, two I want to mention right now are, are red alder, uh, which is a alder that is uh, um, it's native to the Pacific Northwest, but it's often used as a windbreak species. And so uh, that is is one of the faster growing species and probably all the alders. It's just that red alder is the one we happen to have material for that would grow shiitake well 
and would also start to produce uh, thick enough diameter wood in, in under 10 years. And there's something really nice about that. Uh, and, and, and again, we've, we've inoculated alder, and what we've noticed is that that wood is, again, entirely sapwood. So we, you know, may not have to, um, you know, inoculate 8-inch diameter logs because we may get the same productivity out of a 3-inch diameter log that's all sapwood. Um, and that would cut down our coppice time tremendously. Another species, uh, chestnut, especially the European or sweet chestnut, is a, is a particularly fast-growing tree. Um, and, uh, and the other one I would say is birch. And if we think about those species, um, one of the opportunities there is to couple log production potentially in coppice management with like riparian buffer work. Um, so, you know, if we're interested in riparian buffers, often we're looking at species and we want that kind of nice fibrous dense root system to hold our stream banks and work with that. So arguably, you could cut the tops and still maintain some of that benefit because those trees are going to re-sprout and regrow off that root system. So, you know, my my excitement is really around that potential to say, well, you know, long term, yes, we can harvest and thin our woods, but can we also start some of these coppice managements that also help with you know stream stream bed erosion, water quality, mm -hmm. that sort of thing, and start to yield mushroom logs in under a decade. You know, I think. It helps me to narrow that focus, right? Because you could easily say, "Oh, there's all sorts of coppice potential," but I think you know that kind of thing is going to be. More well, yeah, to, great. To I'm I'm adopted. I'm also very interested to, to, to look more into that um, and, and test maybe to try to establish and test some things out. Uh, Steve, if you can see, uh, there is quite a number of questions uh, coming in, and maybe more than we're going to be able to address in in this Q and A session. We could maybe for some of them follow up with email, but. Um, I'll just uh, pick a, a few here. Uh, here's a, probably a recurring question, but Eric Wolski asks, is there any use for the logs after shiitake finishes uh, flushing? In other words, uh, you know, after its you know, productive lifespan, uh, any, any economically viable use for, for that uh, shiitake uh, bolt, inoculated bolt? Um, uh, arguably, the the best right. use is yeah. is back into the forest for for soil health. Um, there was a grant that was done through SARE a few years ago where someone looked at using them in like an outdoor wood furnace. Um, but you know, biologically, the mushroom is eating most of the lignin out of the wood, and so that's most of the heat value. <laughs> so, you know, I think that um. You can't, you know, unfortunately, you can't chip up the log and re-inoculate. It's, it's sort of spent and old. And, and what we tend to do is just use them to line the paths in our forest. And they actually continue to fruit, you know, occasionally a mushroom here or there. And they'll eventually turn back into yep. soil. But I think after the life of the log, there isn't a lot uh, of mm -hmm. value in that sense. Um, Bill um, Garrett, um, soil health. he's a beginning farmer in Sedalia, Missouri, um, he asks, well, he has a 60 acres or 30 acres of timber for various species. He's asking, once mushrooms are harvested and offered at uh, a farmer's market, do I ask what's the best way to offer to consumer? Bulk, by the pound, prepackaged? Uh, and or any advice on, on that, on the marketing at, at a farmer's market? Mm -hmm. Sure. That's a great question, Bill. Um, well, it's, I think it's going to depend on your farmer's market, for one thing, because we've seen a lot of range. But one of the interesting things is that um, if you sell mushrooms by the pound and you say $16 a pound, you will scare the bejeebus out of people and they will not buy them. But if you package that same amount of, you know, that same pound of mushrooms into four pint containers and sell them for $4 a piece, mm. people will probably won't blink an eye and they'll probably be really excited. And it's the exact same price, right? So I think that's what we've seen work on a retail scale is to... Um, sell by you know volume, so if people can see, oh, I get you know this amount of mushrooms for four dollars, and that's just easier right, for yeah. people to, um, so, to, to stomach <laughs> uh, more than the, the per pound. Um, and then you'll get you'll get those buyers that say, hey, I want to buy five pounds in bulk mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. So but a little bit of a uh, uh, smart criteria of in uh, fun in, in your packaging presentation and, and and how you price things can can make a real difference. Uh, it seems. Um, John Paul Learn uh, asks, well, first, thanks so much for your time, Steve, uh, but are you aware or interested in discussions or planning of cooperative farming ventures based around agroforestry uh, so as to meet uh, wholesale and distribution scales? Good question. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks, uh, Steve, in, in the Northeast region. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and good to see you, John Paul. Uh, yeah, we've been in classes together and things. So um, there is Chatham University put in a grant for this this very thing to do cooperative marketing through the Northeast. You know, one of the things that's been discussed is as the market continues to, or as growers continue to, to join the ranks, there'll be less and less of those easy kind of local markets. Um, and so the grant was around looking at ways that cooperatively people could collect and distribute mushrooms, uh, specifically in more urban markets like New York City, you know, um, is kind of a, a wide open, endless market for, for mushroom product potentially. So there's there's the beginnings of conversation. I don't know, you know, they're waiting to see if that gets funded, which is always one of our limitations in that development. Um, I think that there's also just opportunities locally. You know, we have about five growers in our, in our area, which is the, the Finger Lakes in New York, kind of central New York. Who, who have started those conversations and are thinking about cooperative marketing um, more and more. Um, partially it's just because some of us are better at it than others or want to do it more than others and you know some of us have markets established but not enough mushrooms and others are just getting into it. So right now the conversations are very much more on a person-to-person -person basis but I think the potential is there. It might just be a few years off mm -hmm. before we really have okay. more saturation. Um, I, I, I'm going to interject here and just say that um, we have now gone beyond the, the hour, uh, so this would, for those who do have to, to uh, move on to other, other things, understand that. Uh, but if uh, Steve is, uh, uh, so I would thank everyone for their participation. Uh, there will be a recorded version uh, of this presentation on uh, uh, our website, the Agroforestry in Action website. But uh, for those who can stick around maybe for a few more minutes and maybe we'll have a, a few more questions as, as if Steve is... Uh, uh, available. Uh, Steve? Yeah. Are, are you, Steve, are you able to see the, 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 the list yeah, that's of questions fine. that are I'm coming in? Hang out for a little while. Is there any particular one that uh, you would like to, uh, to address? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'll, it looks like I'll just, there's a couple questions about species that can be used for shiitake, so I'll just kind of get those covered all at once and then we can see um, what else there is. So Willow, Farley, and Liam, and Donnie St. John all, so we have questions about sycamore, sassafras, cedar, cedar and wood, mulberry, and yeah. <laughs> uh, other species, cedar, honey locust, okay, other species of acer, other maples, great, and, and um, Liam's in the Pacific Northwest, so big leaf maple. So, <laughs> so uh, I used to say no, and now I say maybe. And I, I encourage you, if you have a species on this list, to to try ten logs because it's a very low investment of time and energy, and and it may yield good results. So a few years ago, we said that no way birch is not productive, but then we found farmers growing exclusively on birch and getting great yields. So, um, and this goes back to also strains because I think that we could potentially be uh, mushrooms are so uh, highly uh, adaptive and sort of responsive to their environment that there's a great potential for someone out there to do breeding work to actually you know, find a shiitake strain that's willing to grow on some of these woods. But I'll just say for now that um, other than sugar maple, uh, we found that red maple, because that's really common in the northeast, is not a great substrate. And that's mostly because the bark doesn't stay on very long. It tends to dry out. Um, I would bet that big leaf maple in the northwest would be a good substrate. Um, just I don't know much about the bark properties, so that's where I, I put an asterisk. Um, sycamore, uh, sassafras, dogwood, potentially, but I haven't heard anyone growing, you know, commercially on those. Um, mulberry, same thing. They they all fit into the sort of wood density category that I would consider as a possibility, um, but we just haven't seen or or tried those um, uh, enough. So I would hope that folks would, you know, try ten or twenty, yeah, and then thanks, and Steve. Um, that to the list because we're always. Uh, I should just. Yeah. Oh, and honey, uh, honey, lo honey locust was the other one. <laughs> um, I would put my chips against honey locust. Yeah, uh, yeah. As a as a potential wood, and, and definitely against black yeah. locust, <laughs> and, and and cedar, black black locust and cedar. Yeah, you know, I think, uh, both I think, rot yeah, resistant. I think you so, might uh, so not, not so have any results on cedar, but but it'd be interesting to see if someone gives it a go. Um, on that, I should say, um, this is Gregory here. 
Um, Field and Forest does have available on the website a chart which lists uh, a, a number of the mushroom species, including shiitake, and uh, a number of tree species, and sort of a an excellent, good, and you know not recommended. And so it does go down uh, the list of many species, including some of the ones we've discussed, and and kind of ranks them based on the available experience. I should mention um, this year I did here in Missouri inoculate some sassafras, uh, walnut. Chinese chestnut and persimmon, uh, not expecting any great results out of there, but uh, later next you know, a year from now, I'll, I'll be able to report whether I got any results on those. Um, Steve, uh, any other uh, the remaining questions here that you'd, you'd, you'd want to uh, have a go at? Sure. So um, it seems like I'm just scrolling. I'm seeing if there's any. Uh combination of questions here. Um, yeah, we got some different ones here. So um, I'm just starting at the top here. So there's a question about using wood chip mulch for shiitake. Uh, shiitake, shiitakes and wood chips don't work well together. Um, Stropharia, the, the red wine cap, Stropharia rugosa annulata would be the, the choice mushroom for, for wood chips. Um, and and those, that's quite a fun mushroom to grow. <laughs> it's pretty easy. Um, arguably even easier than, than shiitake. Um, Susan asks if certified organic can be the verification. Uh, yeah, so, you know, check with your state certifier. It's not, so I, I, I breezed through that a bit. Um, in, in New York, for instance, you can get certified organic shiitakes. Um, what growers were expressing, though, was that the organic standards, just like um, just like with maple syrup is a good example. A lot of agroforestry and woodland products and, and certified organic, the standards don't necessarily mean very much. So, you know, you don't usually spray your maple, maple woods, for instance. Um, or, and same with the shiitake, you know, you're dealing with materials that aren't necessarily um, under sort of some of the more specific standards that are in the organic standards. So, you know, looking about soil amendments and sort of, you know, the different practices. So part of the interest in working with certified naturally grown was just to to look at you know what are the what are the potential standards in production that might be of concern and and the two I would mainly highlight are the quality of water because mushrooms are ninety seven percent water so soaking your logs in water that is is pollute, polluted could be a potential problem the other piece is what you're growing mushrooms on the what we call the substrate. And of course, logs are relatively uh, clean and non-toxic, but what we see is a lot of mushroom growing that's now in urban areas or is, is utilizing recycled or, uh, or agricultural waste, which is great. And that's what we want to grow mushrooms on. That's their role. You know? So I'm happy to see you know, people using coffee chaff and uh, stalks from hay and whatever to, to grow mushrooms on. And, and even um, there's some interesting people folks doing work where they harvest like invasive species like Japanese knotweed and they can dry that out and actually grow mushrooms on it like what a great use for this this you know this organism um, but the challenge with that is that mushrooms are really they're a sponge so in addition to being um, really high in water they'll just soak up whatever's in their environment so theoretically if you're you know in an area where contaminated soils or contaminated water are common and, and a plant might accumulate that and you grow the mushrooms on the plant well you might have a problem with that kind of chain of, of production so um, you know when you dig into that that's why we developed those standards because it got really specific to mushroom production um, so certainly certified organic is good but I just don't think it, it gets specific enough in terms of some of these, well, um, some of these parameters yeah, go ahead so. go ahead Steve sure um, and then Chris, yeah, um, I'll answer one more here. Um, I was just noticing because uh, I think it's a good it's a good point that I didn't bring up. Chris is Chris Evans is asking uh, if most growers buy spawn or or are people producing it on farm? Um, and I didn't mention that spawn, uh, which is the mycelium that you use to inoculate something, is is essentially something that needs to be grown in like a sterile type environment. Um, so a lab essentially. Um, and most of us probably don't have or want to invest in the type of equipment and space to, you know, think about uh, the cost of a certified kitchen, for instance, for value added production is, you know, could be $20,000. Well, a lab could be 50,000 or more. So 
Um, while you can produce spawn in a, on a kitchen counter type setting for yourself, uh, I wouldn't count on it if I was going to farm commercially. And buying from a producer, basically, you know, for a shiitake log, it's about 50 cents a log uh, to, to buy a bag and, and inoculate. So it's a very low cost, and I think it's good to support um, spawn producers, much like if you're a vegetable grower, you, you, you buy seeds from a seed producer. Um, and your quality and your consistency is going to just be much better than if you try to do it yourself. So um, I'm pleased to see that, again, in the past five years, the amount of spawn production has just skyrocketed. So, you know, five years ago, you may have only been able to find two or three companies in the whole USA. And now there's just dozens and dozens popping up, which is great. But the caveat I want to put with that is that right now, uh, spawn production is not a regulated product. And so unlike seeds where you get a, a test and you, you know, they have to print the percent, you know, percent germination rate on the package, spawn is kind of you know, anybody's guess. And, and so the thing you want to think about is that you want to know that where you're buying it from is, is ideally as local to you as possible and also that they've had experience with the mushrooms that they're selling you on the type of thing you're going to grow them on. And basically, it's very easy to grow shiitake spawn in a lab, in, indoors, in controlled conditions. But it doesn't mean that shiitake spawn is going to do well in a log, or it's going to do well in the environment. So, you know, asking a lot of questions um, and saying, hey, are you growing this on, you know, sugar maple or oak? And what's your experience been? I mean, those are really important things to, to do. So, you know, buyer beware when you're, when you're shopping for spawn. And our Cornell Mushroom website ha has a list of suppliers. Um, we don't do any verification of anything. We just are listing uh, ones that our growers have, have utilized. Um, and we're always adding more as people request. So um, that's a good place to start if you want to. Well, um, I think that uh, brings us to the end. Thank you, Steve, for taking a little extra time and addressing some of the remaining questions. Uh, just to remind folks that this webinar has been recorded and will be posted on the Agroforestry in Action website, agroforestryinaction.org website. Um, uh, we'll share with Steve the, the, the question and answer log here, and so if there's any remaining uh, questions that uh, we might follow up uh, by email um, with some of the participants here today. And just to remind folks that, as Steve mentioned, there are uh, comprehensive growers' guides available uh, uh, on a number of locations from Cornell University uh, website, as well as uh, our center for agroforestry's website, we have a shiitake growers guide. So uh, I'd like to thank Steve uh, for an excellent presentation and for, for, for the discussion. I'd like to thank everyone else uh, uh, who participated today for, for being here with us. Um, we'll see you again next time uh, for the next uh, Agroforestry in Action webinar. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.